Lifehouse Church, would you stand and worship with us this morning? Good morning. Welcome to Lifehouse Church this morning. We just want to welcome you guys. And here's what I want to see this morning. If you're a partner, I want everyone to find someone who's new, someone you haven't met, maybe someone you hadn't talked to in a while. And I want you to go give them a big hug. Welcome here so that we can just celebrate that everyone is here gathered to worship Jesus. So let's take a couple of minutes, find someone you don't know, maybe someone you haven't talked to in a while, and let's give people a hug. you guys come back together let's worship together this morning
Everyone needs compassion A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me And everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations Let's sing it out, Savior Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation But He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Take me as you find me With all my fears and failures Lord, fill my life again I give my life to follow Through everything I believe in And I surrender Here we go Sing it out, Savior
Amen. Amen. That's good news, right? So this morning, um, I said it in the first service, I'll say it again. We don't come into this place to, to sing to a God who's dead. Don't. We come into this place to sing to a God who is not only alive, but has conquered death. We, we, we come to worship a God who, who not only gives life, but is life in and of himself. And so when we worship Jesus, this isn't mere words that we're singing to the, the roof today, but we're singing to the heart and into the throne room of God. And what we do when we gather together is we corporately proclaim to the world that Jesus and Jesus alone is the way and the truth and the life. And I'm telling you right now, no one will ever come to the Father except through him. And so when I say Jesus is mighty to save, what I mean is he's mighty to save me and he's mighty to save you. And he could change the world and he does change the world. But what it comes down to is, do we believe? Do we believe what we sing? Do we own what we claim? And this morning, I just encourage you as we continue to sing songs, hey, no matter what, just go for it. I'm going to tell a really quick story. My, my son the other day, he, he knows with the busyness of ministry that we come and go so often, and he knows my routine. So he's getting used to when dad leaves, and he hates it, right? So he's like, no. And I'm getting ready to walk out the door the other night to do some ministry with some guys, and, and he says, dad, I no. And I was like, Okay. So I stop and I hug him and I think he just wants to give me one more kiss before I go. He loves to kiss me on the cheek. And uh, no, he goes, Dada, no, loving you. Dada, no, loving you. And so why do I share that? I share that to say that it's natural for us to love our father. It's natural to want to be embraced by our father. And I don't know where you come into this building today from. I don't know what kind of heart, hurt you have in your heart or the busyness, or maybe it's been a good week, maybe it's been a bad week, maybe it's the mountaintop, maybe it's the valley. But regardless of what it's been, we can all say, Dada, I'm loving you. And so this morning, would you echo the words of my son Jude and just say, Father, Jesus, I'm loving you. And as we sing, would that be our heart? Would we position our mind's attention and our heart's affection on him? Let's worship. Come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bears the spear and tells the wars to cease. A mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who bears the chariots with fire. Lord, who holds the leaders with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle, oh, let us when we are with the Lord.
are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage. I know my God is in control. The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Way the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage. I know my God is in control. Lord, who goes to be with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You guys can be seated. Yeah. Praise God. So this morning, if this is your first time here, again, we want to say welcome to Lifehouse Church. Uh, we honestly believe and, and, and just want to convey to you that you're not just welcome, but you're wanted. This is a place for you. This isn't just another church you could go to, but we honestly, greedily would say we would love to have you. Uh, we believe in two things at this church. One, that we should love God, and number two, that we should love people. So if you came into this place, I pray that you felt the love of God so far and that you felt the love of his church. That's what we're about. Also, if you came in and you didn't get a chance to stop at the new here tent on the outside, we have a gift for you. And we would love to answer any questions or maybe just walk with you on who Jesus is if you don't know that. So if you would just do us the pleasure of stopping by the new here tent on your way out, if nothing else we'd love to give you a gift um, other than that we're about to have Paul come on up and we're going to continue to worship um, through the offering and so what I'd like to do real quick is just pray over us and then Paul's going to lead us in our offering Father, thank you so much that you are good. Jesus, thank you that when we come into this place that um, it's not a place that changes us, but it's our gathering of meeting with you. So, Father, we give you all of today, everything from the offering to the prayer to the praise to the word, God, to the invitation, all of it is yours. And we just declare, Jesus, that you are good. I ask, Father, as we continue in this uh, moment that we would just set our mind's attention and heart's affection on who you are. And God, that we would not let any distractions keep us from what you want to say to us. We pray that whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has for them, that they would receive it this morning. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Good morning, Lifehouse. Okay. I want to make sure we're all awake. Um, but wasn't that great worship time? Anybody want God to move mountains? Yeah? Do we all know that he's the same one that makes the waves calm and speaks to us every day? We know that's who we serve, right? Today I want to talk a little bit about honoring God first. And right now it's the time of our tithes and offerings. But uh, if you want to look up uh, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. But, um, you know, my, my name is Paul Northern, as Danny said, and my wife Patty and I and our family are... Uh, privilege to be partners here at LifeHouse, and we love it here for the last, I guess it's been five or six years. It's been terrific. Um, now is the time when we're going to honor the Lord with our offerings, and as you see on the screen behind me, I think, yep, 
There are some technology-enabled ways to give, but also we'll pass a traditional uh, offering basket. If you're a visitor here or a guest, please don't feel obligated to give, but feel free to allow it to pass, or if the Lord puts it on your heart, please do so. You know, um, as I thought about this today, and I think the last time I may have spoken about this a little bit, we as Americans, we have a tendency to hold things tightly. Do we not? Yep, somebody said yes out there. We do. We hold things so tightly. I wonder why. Because our God has promised to provide all our needs according to his riches and glory. So, you know, what I've learned over my life the gray here would indicate it's a long one, but uh, um, I've learned to open my hand. And when I open my hand, then he can work and work in my life. And I would challenge you to do the same. And as we think about the offering today, open up and let's not just give the things that drip out, but let's give of the first fruits to the Lord. So King Solomon, as this passage talks about a little bit, King Solomon was one of the wisest and most honored men that walked the earth at his time. Uh, He was granted superior wisdom and knowledge. Many of you know that story from the Lord. And from this came sincere honor and respect from all who heard of him throughout the Middle Eastern region. Historians in the Bible says that the Queen of Sheba, who ironically I hear we're going to talk about later, Mark. Um, It's funny how the Lord does that. Traveled over 1,500 miles from Africa with many riches to seek Solomon's wisdom. She had heard about him and wanted to seek her wisdom from him. She had some questions, and she visited with him. A great journey. This wise man in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 said, Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits, not the last, but the first fruits of all your labor and your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You know, many times... We offer God what's left over, as I said, the clenched fists, and we need to open our hand. But many times, what's left over? We need to rather offer the first fruits. I know I've done that in my life at times, and maybe you have as well. Giving to the Lord, folks, is an act of honor and love out of what he has done for us. It's a way of thanking God for all of what he has given to us and provided to us. You know, of the many things your faithfulness here at Lifehouse has done for his kingdom work, there are so many things that, you know, I could talk for quite a while about it, but like our RISE initiative, like the building that you see going up just down the road a little bit, community projects, the outreaches that we do, and mission trips like the one to Africa last month and the one that Joel and I and about 10 people will be going on in March to visit Haiti and serve people there. We thank you for your giving and your faithfulness. So this morning, let's honor God and give into his kingdom with open hands, hearts, and minds, opening clearly for him. And let's look forward as we go into our ninth year here, this first week of our ninth year, with eager expectation and anticipation of what God will do here in this year. Team, you can come forward for the offering, and let's pray. Father God, We thank you for this time of worship, and we thank you for this time when we can worship you with what you have bountifully given all of us. Father, we ask you to bless our hearts, bless every person here, but open our hearts and minds to what you have for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
time to go away. And now my heart is full of Jesus Christ's love. Amen. Doesn't that just make you smile? Not everybody was able to attend the baptism celebration a couple weeks ago, so that's a recap video just to let you know what it's about. Uh, if you don't know, that's an opportunity for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, whether they be young, whether they be old, whether they be men, women, to declare that saving faith in Jesus boldly. Uh, it's symbolic, baptism. It represents the gospel. When you go under the water, it represents the death and burial of Jesus. When you come up out of the water, it represents the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his victory over sin, death, and the grave. And it represents your sins being washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. So it pr truly is a beautiful time. Our next one is the last Sunday in, in uh, May. So if you're a believer and you've not yet been baptized, I encourage you to consider participating on that date. Well, as we begin, I want to ask you a question that will kind of weave its way through the sermon this morning. And that is, have you seen Jesus? Consider that for a moment. Have you seen the light? The light of Jesus Christ firsthand. A passage uh, that just really has impacted me this week in preparation for the sermon is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where the Apostle Paul declares to believers, he says, For God, the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness. If you remember, in the beginning, in creation, Genesis 1 3, God Almighty in the beginning said, Let there be light where there was no light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and it was good. So that God, my God, the one true God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Think about what Paul is declaring. Is that your experience, believer? You who claim to believe and thereby claim to have seen the light. Is that your testimony? Has the light of Jesus, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, shone in your heart? We're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse journey through Luke's gospel. If you have your Bible this morning, I want to encourage you to turn there. Luke chapter 9 and specifically verses 29 through 36. And listen, there's a lot in this passage but I believe the concern, the, the point, the issue that I see Jesus addressing, really confronting rather, is the light. Seeing the light, understanding and knowing and experiencing firsthand the truth of the gospel. In other words, the wisdom of God that leads to salvation and eternal life. You see, there were many in Jesus' day, just like there are many in our day, who claim to be in the know, who claim to be the ones with understanding, who have people to be with the spiritual revelation, wisdom, light, if you will. And in Jesus' day, it was primarily the religious leaders. They were the men who claimed to have the answers, and they were supposed to have at least some of the answers, but they, in reality according to Jesus' confrontation with them, did not have the answers. Jesus confronts them and says, because they said the right things, they went through the right motions, they quote-unquote worshiped God, but Jesus told them, knowing their hearts, said, listen, your lips honor the Lord. You honor the Lord with your lips, but the truth is I see your hearts, and your hearts are far from God. And he says, therefore, the worship that you're engaging in is not worship. He says, it's a farce, it's a joke. These men, these religious men who claim to know the light, claim to know God, but in truth, Jesus tells them, you don't know God. These men claim to know the way to God, but the reality was they were on that broad road that led to destruction. They claimed to see, but Jesus tells them, the truth is, you're blind. You don't see. And Jesus, in the Gospels we see, confront these men. He says, you're like blind people leading blind people. And what happens when that happens, right? A blind person leading a blind, Jesus says, they're both going to fall into a pit. It's not going to be good. So don't follow a blind person. Rather, Jesus says in John 8, 12, 
follow me. He says, I am the light of the world. And he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but instead will have the light of life. So again, have you seen the light? Before we read this passage together, understand that this is mere months before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus' earthly ministry lasted for about three and a half years, and this is about three years into that three and a half year ministry. So for three years, at least, Jesus has been preaching. Jesus has been proclaiming boldly true teaching and in a way that people were amazed by. They told Jesus, never before have we heard someone teach with such power and authority. But beyond that, Jesus was performing miracles, literally doing what no one had even remotely done before. I mean, delivering people from demons. He was healing people, walking on water, feeding thousands of people. And he was doing those things not to just demonstrate his power as the son of God so that people could be amazed and in awe and wowed, but specifically to validate his identity as the son of God. It was about revealing himself as the Christ, the one that God promised to send And understandably, in response to all these things that Jesus has been saying, all the things that he has been doing, not in a corner, but out front, front and center, many believed in him. However, some did not. And some will not. Interestingly, at this point in Jesus' ministry, no one's denying Jesus' power, the miracles. No one could do that. But what some were doing instead were refusing, in their pride and stubbornness, refusing to acknowledge his identity. They were, instead of denying his power, they were denying its source. If you remember in Luke chapter 11, after having delivered the man from a demon possession, a man who had been unable to speak or hear because of the demon, I mean, Jesus, in an instant, delivers that man. He did what no one else could do. And everyone that was there were told. People were there. They saw it. They marveled. However, incredibly, some who were there protested. And they reasoned ridiculously that Jesus did what he did, not by the power of God, but by the power of Satan. While others, Luke eleven sixteen, said that Jesus, as if Jesus, what he did was not sufficient, they said they, some kept seeking from Jesus a sign from heaven to test him. That's the immediate context that leads us into this passage. Will you stand with me as we read it together? Luke chapter 11 starting in verse 29. And remember, church, brothers and sisters, we're standing in reverence because we believe this to be God's holy word, truth. In verse 29, it says that when the crowds, the people that wanted to hear and see Jesus, crowds were increasing, Jesus began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and contemn this generation, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Oh Lord, would you bless the reading of your holy word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So again, as we consider these words, I ask you, have you seen the light? Have you seen or will you see Jesus? In John's gospel, chapter 3, we're told that a religious leader in Jesus' day, one among whom those in general opposed Jesus, he was a Pharisee, a teacher in Israel, his name was Nicodemus. 
And likely in fear of his contemporaries who opposed Jesus, he went to Jesus under cover of darkness because he didn't want those others of his, uh, who he was associated with to know that he went to Jesus. So under the cover of darkness, he went to Jesus and he respectfully addressed Jesus as rabbi. He humbly acknowledged that there was more to Jesus than met the eye because he said specifically, Jesus, look, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs, these miracles that you do, that we see you do, unless God is with him. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was confused by what Jesus meant, by being born again. He thought Jesus was talking about being physically born again. In other words, born for a second time. He said, how can a grown man go back into his mother's womb? How is that possible? How can someone be born again? And Jesus explained that he was not talking about that. He was talking about those being born of the flesh. In other words, to see they must then subsequently be born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In other words, born from above. Jesus said, to see the kingdom of God, you need to be born from above. And then Jesus questioned Nicodemus, this Israel, this teacher of Israel, this, this Pharisee. He says, listen, you're a teacher of Israel. You're supposed to have the answers. You're supposed to teach people these things. And yet you do not understand these things. And he says in John 3, 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We testify, we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Because you don't understand, you don't know, you don't see. In Luke 11, 29 through 36, Jesus diagnosed the spiritual condition of a generation. And with that diagnosis, and understand it's a terrible, it's a terminal diagnosis beyond that. He speaks of the symptoms associated with that diagnosis. And he speaks of there, this generation's demand. And then he speaks of their defiance. And then he speaks of their darkness, their demand, their defiance, and their darkness. Incredibly sadly, if you think about what Jesus diagnosed them of, Jesus, their healer, was right there. The one that they were unwilling to hear, the one that they were unwilling to see, he was right before them. Jesus, again, was the light of the world and this people, this generation, as an evil generation, they were in darkness. If Jesus was the sun, S-U-N sun, it was like high noon on a cloudless day. I mean, that's what it was like, but they would not see. Therefore, they would not benefit from the light. Again, at this point, everybody, in this point in Jesus' ministry, everybody was talking about Jesus. Everyone knew about Jesus who did what no one else could do, who preached with authority and with power. And so they sought to hear Jesus. They sought to see for themselves Jesus. They came from all around. Luke eleven twenty nine 29 says crowds of people were increasing, growing. Jesus has an audience. More and more people wanted to hear and see. And when the crowds were increasing, Jesus began to say, and this is boldly, this generation is an evil generation. This is Jesus telling it like it is. Listen, if I'm going to the doctor and something's wrong, I want the doctor to tell me what's wrong. I don't want him to sugarcoat anything. I don't want him to hide anything. I want him to tell him what is wrong. Jesus is the great physician. Listen, they didn't need to get a second opinion. No one greater than the great physician. It's Jesus, and he's not sugarcoating anything. He's telling it like, him, like them like it is. He's not minimizing their spiritual condition. He's saying to this people, the men of that time and that place, that they were, and they're his people, but they were a generation of men who were evil. He said, this generation, this people, and that's what's amazing. They were very religious, and because they were religious, they viewed themselves as righteous and everyone else unrighteous. They viewed themselves as good and everyone else as bad. They viewed themselves as clean and everyone else as defiled. But in reality, this was an evil generation. Again, religious but not righteous. He boldly told them, contrary to what you present yourselves to be, you're not righteous, you're not good. In fact, you're the opposite of good. You're an evil generation. Now, the truth is, Romans 3.23 says all men fall short of the glory of God. The truth is, Romans 3.10, we're told no one is righteous. No, not one. But that generation, the people, they really thought, and they declared themselves to be a righteous generation. 
when they were in reality an evil generation. When Jesus confronts the religious people of his day, and this was not the only occasion here in Luke chapter 11, this on other occasions, I can't help but think about those talent shows like American Idol and The X Factor. I've talked about it before where people now and then come on the show and they sing their hearts out and they have such confidence and they think that they're just awesome performance, that they've got talent, that they're going to be the next American Idol. But in reality, they're horrible, right? They're terrible. Like someone lied to them, probably their mom. And they can't hear, they, they, they literally are clueless. I feel like that's kind of what's going on here spiritually and not to be sacrilegious, but I kind of feel like Jesus is Simon Cowell. He's just telling them like it is. He's not holding anything back. This, you're terrible. This generation is an evil generation. You're not good. You're not righteous. I hope that wasn't sacrilegious. <laughs> Jesus said in the latter part of Luke eleven twenty nine, 29, this generation, it seeks for a sign, for more signs. Remember 11, Luke eleven sixteen, 16, they kept seeking from Jesus a sign from heaven to test him. They didn't want to know who Jesus was. They didn't want to worship Jesus. They just wanted more miracles. They weren't about to bow down to Jesus. Jesus just delivered a man who was demon possessed in a way that no one else had delivered a man who was demon possessed. Nothing more was needed. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, we're told about another incredible miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. There were 5,000 men. In addition to 5,000 men, there were also women and children there. And he fed them all with five barley loaves and two fish that a small boy gave and offered. Right? And we're told in that passage, it was miraculous. Not only, I mean, people didn't just get a crumb. We're told that specifically everyone that was there, 5,000 men and then women and children, in addition to that, everyone had their fill. Everyone had as much as they wanted, and incredibly, after when everyone had their fill, we're told that they gathered 12 basket full left over. It was an undeniable miracle, and the people loved it. They were amazed by it. No one could deny that Jesus had done what no one else could do, and John 6, 14 says that when the people, all the people that were there, 5,000 plus people, when they saw that sign, they said, this is indeed the prophet. There's no other explanation that Jesus is the Christ, the one that God promised this is indeed the prophet. Everyone agreed. And realizing that, they saw an opportunity for themselves. Instead of simply bowing down before him and worshiping him, we're told that they wanted to impose and demand on Jesus their own plans for Jesus. They wanted to make Jesus their king so that he could do what they wanted him to do, like a genie, right? The, the thing is, Jesus is not a genie. He's Jehovah. Jesus came to do so much more than make worldly wishes come true. Jesus came to accomplish so much more, infinitely more than to fill people's pockets with earthly treasures and to facilitate their temporary pleasures. And sadly, we see that same mentality play out over and over in the Gospels. People who were looking, waiting for the Messiah, rejecting the Messiah because he wasn't going to play by the rules. And specifically in John chapter 6, after this amazing miracle where Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children, when some men see that Jesus is not going to be their genie, who he's not there to avail himself to their demands, perhaps like helping them win the lottery or making them superstars, tragically many of those people, we're told in John chapter 6, turned their back on Jesus and walked away. And I see the same thing today. Men all the time. It burdens me so much as a pastor. And listen, no one's denying the struggles that we go through, the suffering that we go through, the hard, devastating times and situations. We live in a fallen world. That's why I'm thankful God sent Jesus to redeem us from this world. But understand Jesus, not the genie Jesus, Jehovah Jesus, does not cater to our whims to give us or men what they want or what we want when we want it. I see so often when that happens, when people don't get what they want when they want it, they get angry with God. As if they had a right to be angry with God. Listen, God loves us. And he proved it. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated his love for us, or 8.5, in that while we were still sinners, in other words, undeserving of his love, God demonstrated and proved his love for us, me and you, in that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross. So listen, you may not understand your situation or circumstances, but we all need to view our situation and circumstances through that lens. 
We can trust a God who stepped up to the plate for us, who didn't just tell us that he loves us, but showed us he loves us. But so often, just like we see in John chapter 6, people walk away and turn their back on who they think is supposed to be their genie. Jesus came to give us eternal life. Jesus came to redeem and reconcile men who are sinners, who sin to a holy, righteous God, men who deserve condemnation. He came to give life and freedom and joy and peace despite the circumstances that we go through in this fallen world. And yet men get angry and they walk away. King David rightly expresses to God in Psalm 8, 4, what is man that you were even mindful of him? Wise King Solomon shares in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, he says, the, it, it, the beginning, the, to fear the Lord, in other words, to respect and revere the Lord God Almighty, not as a genie, but as Jehovah, is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is light. Jesus diagnosed that generation as a wicked, evil generation. Instead of believing Jesus, they tested Jesus, seeking more signs from Jesus. God tells his people in Deuteronomy 6.16, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Is that what you do? In Exodus chapter 17, listen, God told them in Deuteronomy, I'm not okay with you putting the Lord your God, me, to the test. Right? God delivered his people from the promised land. If you remember the story, the testimony, they were slaves in Egypt. They had been slaves for hundreds of years, living under severe affliction and oppression. Talk about suffering. But God delivered them incredibly. I mean, he parted the Red Sea for them. Remember, they walked through on dry ground. And not only that, their enemies were chasing after them to bring them back into slavery. But God destroyed their enemies completely and utterly. And then he took them to this place where there was no water. And what was their immediate reaction? They're thirsty. So they start grumbling. They start complaining. They said to Moses, the, God, the guy God appointed to, to deliver him, why did you even bring us up out of Egypt? Why did you bring us out of slavery to make us die of thirst? Now listen, they were in a desperate situation. They were in a situation where they needed the Lord to provide for them, to intervene. But the point where they tested the Lord that God was not okay with was instead of trusting the Lord through that situation, doubt and fear overtook them, and they came to the conclusion, oh, God must have forgotten us. They tested God and they said, oh, I guess the Lord's just not here with us anymore. Because the Lord simply wasn't meeting their expectations when they wanted him to meet their expectations. So despite, with having no regard, forgetting completely about all the things that God had already done, they questioned his reliability. And so in Deuteronomy 6.16, God, in his anger, told his people, remember when you tested me? Yeah, don't do that. You should not put the Lord your God to the test. That's what we see God's people doing in Luke chapter 11. And sadly, it's what so many of us do today. God forbid that you would do that today. In Luke eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, This evil generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. This generation, that generation, those people in general were all familiar with the testimony of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet who had been swallowed by a big fish and he was in the belly of that big fish for three days and three nights and incredibly, the great fish, if you remember, vomited Jonah out alive upon the dry land. It was a miracle. Jesus here in Luke 11, when referring to that sign, is pointing forward to his resurrection. Right? He was crucified. They placed his, he died, they placed his lifeless body into a tomb. They sealed that tomb and he was in that tomb for three days. And on the third day, he rose again. That's what Jesus came to do in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 33. He says, and he told his disciples, listen, the disciples who followed him because he knew exactly what was going to go down in Jerusalem. He told them what was going to go down in Jerusalem. He says in Mark 10, 33, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. That's where God sent me. That's where I'm going. And when we get there, the son of man, he's referring to himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and they will spit on him, and they will flog him, and they will kill him but after three days he will rise and that's exactly what he did he says you want a sign I'll give you a sign wait for it the sign of Jonah in Luke 11 we see that evil generation demand and this leads to the next symptom we see their defiance 
In Luke 11.30 it says, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The testimony of Jonah was way more about him and the fish because after that, after the fish vomited it up, God commanded him to go. Actually, he told him before that happened, but he didn't want to do it because he didn't like the people of Nineveh. But God said, you're going to do what I called you to do. And that was to tell the people of Nineveh, the city that were very wicked, that were very evil, that judgment was going to come upon them because of their wickedness. God sent Jonah to tell them the truth, to reveal to them that God was not okay with their wicked ways. And because of their wicked ways, the wrath of God was going to be poured out upon them, the entire city. And incredibly, the people of Nineveh, unlike the evil generation that Jesus was confronting in the Gospels, they believed God. Incredibly, upon the preaching of Jonah, you can read about it in the Old Testament, the men of Nineveh, these wicked, evil people, wholeheartedly repented of their evil. We're told the whole city turned to God, all of them from the greatest to the least of them. They all repented and they all cried out to God for mercy in hopes that God would show them mercy. And guess what? Our merciful God did. He showed them mercy. God showed them mercy. Unfortunately, though, Because of the wicked generation that Jesus was confronting, their defiance would not lead to repentance. That would not be the case. In Luke 11, 32, Jesus says that those men of Nineveh who repented, they would rise up at the judgment with this generation and they will condemn this generation for they repented at the preaching of Jonah when this generation would not Jesus was there. Something greater than Jonah was there before them. But they didn't take advantage of the greatest. That's something greater that was there. And he further sheds light on their defiance when he talks about this queen of the south who was pursuing truth. She had heard about the wisdom of Solomon and she wondered if those stories were true, that no one was wiser than this King Solomon. And so she sought the truth, like Paul said earlier, traveled thousands of miles to to understand and know and gain truth for herself, light for herself. And she found it. We're told that when she got there and she heard everything and saw everything with her own eyes, we're told that it took her breath away. I mean, she was overwhelmed and she received all that information. It was a positive thing. And Jesus says in Luke eleven thirty one 31, that this queen of the South, just like the Ninevites, she would rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation. But what she did rightly, the people of that generation were doing wrongly. When they all rise at the judgment, she will, because of what she did rightly, condemn them that did wrongly. And Jesus said, behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When Jesus is referring to the judgment, he's referring to that day of reckoning. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then after that comes the judgment. For those who are in Christ, right, where there is therefore now no condemnation, just like that baptism symbolized, our sins have been washed away, they will be, uh, die and they will go and spend eternity with, with God in heaven. But those in Revelation 20, it says, in 12, it says that on that day, great and small will stand and give an account before God and judged according to what they had done. And all those, Revelation 20, 15, whose names are not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. This is a big deal. Seeing the light and not seeing the light is a big deal. The Ninevites saw the light. They were wicked. They were evil, but they saw the light and they simply repented. They cried out to God for mercy. They believed in God and God showed them mercy. The queen of the south, she wasn't even from God's people. She was a Gentile, but she sought the light. She found the light and she responded to the light. And Jesus said something greater was there before them. The kingdom of heaven was right there. His arms were open wide. He's the light of the world. But that generation didn't want to see him. They were defiant. Jesus told them in Luke 11, 33, no one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand that those who enter the house may see the light. God wants us to see the light. He wanted people to see Jesus and respond to Jesus, to listen to Jesus and repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Jesus and be saved. But they would not. They were defiant. Paul addressed that generation in Acts 13. He says, listen, you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life because you thrust aside The gospel, basically. In John 3, 19, Jesus says, this is the judgment. Talking about himself, he says, light has come into the world, but people love darkness 
rather than the light because their works, their deeds were evil. He says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Sadly, this defiance that we see in Luke chapter 11 causes them to remain in darkness. Jesus is letting them know here, this last point, if you don't see the light, the problem's not with the light. The light's on the stand. Jesus was there. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. The light was shining bright. Something greater than Jonah was there before them. Something greater than Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, was right there before them. If you want a truth, no truth, Jesus is the truth. Go to Jesus. He was standing there right before them. It was not with the light. That was not the problem. The problem was with their sight. They did not have a light problem. They had a sight problem. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Luke eleven thirty four. Jesus explains, your eye is the lamp of your body. Again, he's speaking spiritually. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, as in good, when you can see the light, your whole body is full of light. When, but when your light is, eye is bad, as in blind, you can't see the light, even though the light's shining. And therefore, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, verse 35, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. And then verse 36, and then your whole body, when it is full of light, having no part dark, if you see, you will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Really, I think this is a spiritual litmus indicator. Again, remember the context here in Jesus' day where there are a lot of people who claim to know the truth, claim to have light, understanding, wisdom, claim to be the bridge and tell people how to get to God, but they didn't have any of the answers. And Jesus is telling them, look, if someone has light, if they can see the light, they're going to shine the light. Just like he says, listen, you want to know who's truly my disciples? You will know them by their fruit, right? The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. You're going to see those things evidenced in their lives. He said, if you want to know who my true disciples are, you will know them by the love that they have for one another. You're not going to have to convince them with your words. You're going to show them that you're truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you have the light, if you have seen the light, it's not going to be confusing for anybody. You are going to shine the light of Christ. I believe this is a spiritual litmus indicator. I think it's practical on one part for believers to know and understand that if I'm a believer, if I've seen the light, I should be shining the light. But the other application are for those who've not yet seen the light to don't look to people who aren't shining the light of Christ. Listen, a lot of people claim to know and have seen the light, but they're leading people astray. They are blind guides leading the blind. And when that happens, both fall into a pit and Jesus doesn't want people to fall into a pit. And so I ask you, first of all, believers, as we bring it to a close this morning, are you shining the light of Christ? You who claim to have seen the light. Jesus is the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness anymore because he will have the light that leads to life. This is what John says to believers in 1 John 1, 5, 6. He says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say as believers we have fellowship with him, that we know him, that we see him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 8 to believers, he says, at one time you were in darkness but now you're light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. See, in Jesus' day, this was a problem. Because these religious leaders were leading people astray. And can I say I believe that this is a problem in our day? Because so many people claim the name of Jesus Christ. So many people wear the t-shirt and they put on their Facebook account, Christian. They claim the name of Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. And they're causing confusion because they're not shining the light. The light in them is not light. Instead, it's darkness. And they are blind people leading blind people. If you're a mom and dad and you claim to know the light and you don't know the light and your people are following you, you are a blind person leading blind people. And God has a problem with that because he wants people to see the light. Believers shine the light of Christ. And as we close, listen, 
I know this may seem overwhelming. This is my testimony. I grew up in church, and I didn't know who Jesus was. I thought I did. I thought I had a light, lot of light in me. I could sing good. I could quote Bible verses, and I, you've heard my testimony. Parted my hair to the side. I looked the part. I looked righteous. I was very religious. I didn't realize that I was separated from God in my sin and sinfulness. You see, my problem was I was comparing myself to people. Turn on the TV, look at that murderer, look at that rapist. I'm a good person. I must be righteous. But the problem is other people are not the standard. Jesus is the standard. And all have sinned and have fall short of the glory of God. And that included me. And I didn't realize that. I was not righteous. I was unrighteous. And when I got that, when it finally the light turned on when I saw the light. You know what I did? I dropped to my knees and I asked and I begged God for mercy. The thing is, you can do the same thing. If you've not seen the light, can I tell you, God wants you to see the light. God wants you to see him. God wants you to know him. His arms are open wide to you no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. The blood of Christ is sufficient to cover all your sins. If you think they're not, look at this testimony. Remember the Ninevites, they were a wicked people. God was going to pour his wrath on their city because they were known for wickedness, for evil. And yet they simply repented. They turned to God and they begged God for mercy. And the testimony is God showed them mercy. And the queen of Sheba, she was not a religious person. She was far from God. She was thousands of miles, so to speak, from God in Africa. But she wanted to know truth. You know what the Bible says? If you seek the truth, you will find the truth. That's what the queen of Sheba did. And that's what she found. No matter how far you think you are from God. Listen, he is repentance away. All you need to do is turn your back on your sin and receive what God wants to give you. Let him open your blind eyes. Let him unlock your deaf ears. Let him take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. His arms are open wide to you. The Bible says, behold, today, now is the day of salvation. The opportunity is here. That Listen, something greater than Solomon is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. We have God's word. We know the gospel. Romans 1.16 says the gospel, this gospel that Jesus died, that he came. He's the, the son of God, nothing less than the son of God. He came, he emptied himself and came was born in the likeness of men, was crucified on a cross, was buried, and he rose again. Listen, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus, what it says in the Bible is, everyone who calls upon his name shall be saved. So listen, if that's you this morning, if you've not seen the light, what the Bible says is call upon his name. He wants to reveal himself to you. So I encourage you to do that. So believers, the charges, the challenges, shine the light. Be who you are called to be. Don't cause confusion. Don't let it be ambig ambiguous. If, your body, if you've seen the light, your whole body will be full of light. No part dark. Shine the light. Shine brightly. That's what, the, 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 what Jesus says, someone who's seen the light, looks like. But if you've not seen the light, unbeliever, stop being defiant Remain no longer in darkness and simply receive and respond to the Lord Jesus Christ who came so that you could be set free from your sins. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we need you as a people. We all need you. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I simply humbly ask you to show mercy today and do for others here what you did for me and others in this room. If there are some here who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who have not seen Jesus, who have not seen the light, oh Lord, I pray that you will right now shine into their darkness, that you will open their blind eyes and unlock their deaf ears and help them to understand and know your amazing love for them and that salvation is found in you and you only. And if they would simply repent of their sins, Holy Spirit, speak this to their hearts right now, that if they would repent of their sins, be willing to turn their back on those things that separate them from a holy, righteous God that caused death for them, if they would turn their back on those things and to you, the Lord of life, you will save them. 
Holy Spirit, reveal that to them right now, I pray in Jesus' name. If you're here and you want to see the light, if you're ready to turn your back and repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now where you're seated. Call upon the name of Jesus. Just in your seat, right where you're seated, say, Jesus, I need you. Say, Jesus, I want you. Please come into my heart and save me. Wash my sins away on the blood that you shed on that cross. Do for me what I know no one else can do for me. Save me. Shine your light in, on, and through me for your glory so that I can shine your light. Save me, Lord. That's you if you prayed that prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed just to give you an opportunity to testify of that. Don't be ashamed. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. But if that's you, if you prayed that prayer, would you simply just acknowledge that by lifting your hand? Amen. Anyone else? Just so I can see it real quickly and pray with you. This is an opportunity for you simply to declare. Anyone else? Amen. Father God, speak to these. Be faithful to these, I know you will. Fill their whole body with light. Where there is darkness, shine light, I pray. And where there is death, breathe life. Do what only you can do, Father. And believers, how about it? Consider your life right now. You who claim to have seen the light, are you shining the light of Jesus Christ? Is your whole body full of light? Are you brightly shining what you should be shining? Do your works give testimony that that you love the Lord your God? They should. I would simply say, if that's not the case, why not? Is there something that you need to repent of this morning? Is there fear, anxiety? Do you need to lay that aside, surrender that, and look to the Lord? And instead of complaining and putting the Lord your God to the test, do you simply need to trust him and cling to his promises in your word and remember that he demonstrated his love for you already in that while you were still a sinner, he sent Jesus to die on a cross for you? Do you simply need to remember and rest in that reality no matter what the situation is you're going through? God is faithful. How about you declare that today instead of be angry with him? How about you fear the Lord? That's the beginning of the wisdom. Shine the light of Christ in and through your dark situation. If you're not doing that, ask the Lord to help you do that because he wants to do that. lift high the name of Jesus. Church, let's stand and sing and respond. The altar is open and I encourage you to come and kneel and bow before the Lord. Don't test the Lord. Bow before the Lord. He is faithful.